talk is by Jeff Thompson, uh, Nanoscale Quantum Systems with uh, Singen Atkins. So without further ado. All right. Um, so I uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad for the uh, opportunity to be here and tell you about the work that I did uh, during my PhD in Misha Lukin's group at Harvard in collaboration with Vlad Vuletic on, on creating kind of nanoscale quantum systems with single atoms. So um, basically, you know, the, the kind of the broad perspective for this is that there's a, a lot of ideas about how you might want to make kind of quantum networks where you can send information over long distances. And an important ingredient of this is having some kind of interface between a stationary quantum qubit that can store a quantum state for a little while and a photon that can propagate that thing over some long distance. And um, the kind of the specific physical platform that we're going to work in is a coupling a single trapped laser-cooled atoms together with nanophotonic structures, which we just heard about a lot in the previous talk. And there are three basic reasons that we want to do it this way. Uh, the first is that these photonic crystal cavities, because they're very small, so they can have mode volumes that are less than a cubic wavelength, can give you very large uh, coherent atom-photon coupling rates, uh, which makes kind of the figure of merits that are for the, important for this quantum information, figures of merit, rather, for this quantum information, very large. Um, so they have these small volumes, but additionally, given that they have such small volumes, these dielectric nanophotonic structures actually have surprisingly low optical loss. Um, and this is actually not, not such a trivial thing to achieve in the optical domain, unlike, say, in the microwave, where you can just use metals, like superconductors, basically, in the optical domain. It's actually not so easy to shrink things down and keep this low loss. So these are, these are nice structures in that regard. Okay, the second advantage then, so that's an advantage about these cavities, then the reason to kind of try to couple these things to cold atoms is that these laser-cooled atoms really have uh, sort of unparalleled coherence properties and n basically no inhomogeneity. So every rubidium atom that we trap in a different structure anywhere in the world would be exactly the same. Um, and then the third advantage, again, about these photonic crystals is that the, the, you know, these things are physically small and the techniques that we use to make them are, are kind of intrinsically kind of parallel. So you can really imagine in, in some uh, future world making really large numbers of these things that are very dense and integrating them with sort of more traditional photonic circuits and also optical fiber networks very efficiently. Um, so there's been uh, you know, a lot of uh, work done in, in uh, optical frequency cavity QED in a variety of experimental systems and kind of putting things on two axes where you have different, um, different emitters, different atoms, maybe real or artificial, and different types of cavities. There's sort of, uh, you know, this, this field sort of started with macroscopic uh, Fabry-Perot cavities and then moved with, with, with laser-cooled atoms inside them and then moved towards smaller structures. At the same time, there's work been done with quantum dots and uh, things like NV centers in these really nanoscale structures, so we want to kind of live in this corner down here. And the hope is that this gives you kind of the best of both worlds where you have the nice coherence properties of this uh, column together with the kind of strong coupling and scalable uh, approach with this, this row down here. Um, so, um, so, you know, the, the, like a, a kind of a very specific example of a quantum information task that you might try to solve with this kind of system is that you have, uh, if you imagine that you have two atoms and there's a quantum state, say, in the electron spin of one of them, and you want to send it to the other one, you can induce this atom to emit a photon that's maybe entangled with this quantum state, and then it propagates over here and it's absorbed, and now these two atoms can be entangled with each other. But in reality, if you try to do this with two atoms in free space, as, as the previous speaker said, it's, it's a pain because these photons just go into three dimensions and you can't get them. Um, so then the advantage of using this nanostructure is that by putting this atom right next to this nanostructure, the kind of optical density of states seen by this atom is just completely dominated by the localized mo optical mode of this structure. This, so this photon with overwhelming probability will go into this structure, and then we can steer it wherever we want by just fabricating this as we like and, and get it to go to another atom, say. So if you can do this kind of thing, you can use this, you can connect these things together with optical fibers and achieve long distance transmission of quantum states, or you can uh, put a bunch of these atoms together in one structure and use the kind of a local uh, light mediated interaction to do either quantum gates between the atoms or to study kind of the, you know, the many body dynamics of this quantum system in a, in a highly, controlled, uh, highly controlled way. Um, so in this talk, um, what, what I'll tell you about is, is uh, largely, I mean, some experimental techniques to put these systems together, but then the, the kind of quantum optics results will be about how to use one atom positioned next to this structure to control the way that light propagates through this structure. So in particular, we'll have a kind of a one-dimensional waveguide where if we don't do anything to it, we don't have an atom nearby, light will just be transmitted through it. But now if we put this one single atom close to it and it's, it's strongly coupled to it, then the light that comes in will actually be reflected. And because this single atom is not a piece of dirt, but actually a quantum object, uh, then, then we can have kind of a control over the way that light propagates through this waveguide at the, at the quantum level. Um, all right, so, so with that, then, in uh, the first part of my talk, I'll tell you about the kind of experimental techniques that we've realized to, to put these systems together, and then some, some quantum optics experiments that we've done with them. <laughs> 
Um, so these, uh, these optical uh, nano cavities that we use are, are 1D photonic crystals. And um, we, the way that we think of them is you just start with basically a waveguide. So it's a dielectric waveguide that has a kind of a cross section uh, of order of the wavelength squared. So without doing anything else other than having this, you just have a light mode that propagates down it. But now we, we drill some holes into it, and these holes create a photonic band gap. So there's a, a range of frequencies in which light can't propagate now. And this, if you have light at, you know, within that band gap incident on the section, it's just going to reflect back. So you basically make a mirror, it's just, like a, just like a Bragg mirror in this one-dimensional waveguide. And if you put two of these together with a little defect in between them, then you create a cavity, essentially a localized optical mode. And you can understand the properties of this cavity by doing really a 3D you know, numerical simulation of, of, uh, of the way that light evolves in the structure, and you get something that looks like this. So this color shading here shows you the electromagnetic energy density, E squared, inside the structure. And if you look at the projections of it, you see in the transverse direction to this waveguide, uh, so this is this waveguide shown here with the holes. You look in the transverse direction, the light is basically you know, quite tightly confined and decays exponentially as you move away from it. That's, this is just the evanescent field of the waveguide. And then if you look along the axis of this structure, the, there's uh, sort of a couple of periods of this lattice in the middle where the light has roughly equal intensity and then it decays exponentially into the mirrors uh, because as you go into the band gap region. So it's confined along the axis by these mirror segments. And then you can compute um, a couple of numbers that are, that are relevant. Uh, the first is you can ask what is the volume of this, the, the mode volume of this cavity. This is the size of the box, basically, that the photon lives in, and it's about half a cubic wavelength. Um, and then you can also say, ask what, well, how fast is this, this uh, uh, the, so the energy density decay as you move away from the structure, which is going to be important when we ask, want to ask how close do we have to get an atom to this structure to couple to this mode. And the characteristic length scale is that the energy, energy density falls off by a factor of two every 30 nanometers. So we want to get actually quite close to couple to this structure. Okay, so we make these uh, at, in the clean room at Harvard uh, using what are by now totally standard uh, techniques. We make them out of silicon nitride, that's dielectric material, it has a refractive index of two, and we start with a, basically a, a wafer with a thin film of silicon nitride on top of silicon, and then we use electron beam lithography and reactive ion etching to make, uh, out of this thin film, to make uh, structures like this. And we make thousands of them at a time on a, on a small chip, uh, and then an electron micrograph zoomed in of one of them is, looks sort of like this. Um, we characterize these things just like you would characterize any cavity by taking a, you know, a transmission or a reflection spectrum. And so the reflection spectrum of a kind of a typical one of our cavities is shown here. Uh, from, the, uh, from the width, you can extract information about the loss rate, so basically the Q of the system. And the best cavities that we can make have quality factors that are approaching half a million. Um, although actually the cavities that we use in this work, we deliberately make the Q much lower by by increasing the damping into the waveguide by just putting fewer holes into this mirror section. And we do that so we can actually get the light in and out to do quantum optics experiments. So in this work, we actually have a Q of about 15,000 limited by damping into the waveguide. Can you say a few more words why it looks the way it looks with its petals and yeah. the ink at the end? Um, yeah, let me do that on this slide. So, um, so, so uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. So, um, so you know, we have this chip with a bunch of them, but then actually, um, in order to get this thing into our experiment, we do sort of one more step in the fabrication, which is to make uh, an uh, optical fiber taper, just starting with a standard single mode optical fiber and then using a heat and pulling to, to taper it down to a point. And then we use a micro manipulation stage to pick up just one of these photonic crystal cavities off of the substrate, which we've already characterized. So we pick you know, the one we want, and then we attach it to the end of this tapered optical fiber. So you can see the fiber here in this SEM picture, and then this waveguide here. And there are two reasons that we do this. Um, the, the first is that this lets us mechanically support this single photonic crystal cavity without having a substrate around. So that when we then go to put it into our vacuum chamber, we basically have a needle-like perturbation that we can stick into the region of the vacuum chamber where the atomic physics happens, rather than having this substrate around, which is going to be very perturbative for all the laser cooling. So it lets us support it without a substrate. But then also, equally importantly, this fiber taper lets us couple light in and out of this cavity, um, uh, which is the whole point of the experiment. And, uh, and you know, by engineering this junction here actually very carefully, which we think of as an adiabatic mode transformation from the mode of this fiber into the mode of the waveguide, we've recently been able to get this to the point where 97% of the photons that start out in the single mode fiber make it into the waveguide here, so through this, through this junction here, um, which is you know, for, for kind of these quantum optics applications quite important. Now, the, now uh, Andreas's question about the weird the, the reason this looks weird. So the first thing is this paddle over here um, is coated. So this is all silicon nitride here, but this, this white spot here is a, a little patch of amorphous silicon that we've deposited on top of it. And unlike the silicon nitride, this is actually very lossy. It absorbs a lot of light. And we use this to our advantage in the vacuum chamber. We heat this with a laser, or we hit this with a laser and it absorbs light and heats up the structure. And we use that to thermally tune 
the resonance. So by heating this thing a few hundred degrees, we can shift the resonance by two nanometers or so. Um, the second question is why there's this weird bend, and that's um, kind of an uninteresting historical story about the angle of ports on our vacuum chamber and where things go in and where things come out. So, um, Yeah, oh, sorry, it's a hockey stick, I'm sorry. Um, well, no, anyways. Um, okay, so, so now that we have this structure, what we'd like to do is bring an atom in and trap it very close to this thing. And there are two kind of challenges that you face uh, when you want to do this. Um, and, and sorry, I, the kind of the target distance we'd like to get is 200 nanometers. So this is, uh, you know, not too large compared to that 30 nanometer uh, decay length of the evanescent fields, um, but also not too small that it's impossible. Um, and the, the two challenges that you have are, are one that at this distance uh, there's actually a pretty strong attractive forces between the atom and the surface. This is the Casimir force, the Van der Waals force. And uh, when I say strong, I mean these forces are strong compared to what I would call typical trapping forces for either optical dipole traps or, or certainly much stronger than magnetic traps. Um, so in, in when we go to engineer the trap that we're going to hold the atom in, we have to pay, you know, take care to make sure that it's, it can deal with these surface forces, that you still have a stable trap in the presence of surface forces. The second challenge, though, is that if you want the atom to be you know, 200 nanometers from the surface, then there's some sense in which I have to control the position of the atom with a precision of at least 200 nanometers. Um, and the, here the challenge is thermal motion, at kind of, even at you know, what are pretty cold laser cooled temperatures in the grand scheme of things like 100 microkelvin, the RMS uncertainty in the position of the atom can easily be microns and that's you know, much larger than this. So, so, um, so before telling you how we've kind of solved this problem, I would sort of want to reference some, some, uh, some other work in the field. I think this, this work that, that, that Jeff also mentioned by, done by Arno Gauschenbeutel on trapping arrays of these atoms along these single optical fibers, which was done around the time that we were starting this experiment, I think was really important for, for us and the field too, because it, it was kind of an existence proof that you could do this stuff, that it wasn't completely impossible and too scary to get atoms this close to the surface. So while we didn't adopt exactly any specific techniques from this paper, I think it, it sort of made us comfortable that what we were trying to do was not, not crazy. And this technique is so robust that it's actually been, been duplicated by many groups now. It's a very, very effective technique. Um, and then at the same time that we were doing this, also uh, uh, Professor Kimball's group at Caltech was, was pursuing similar ideas with similar types of structures. And, uh, so, but but our, our approach is uh, kind of the, the full uh, experimental apparatus in cartoon form looks like this. So we have this structure that I told you about, and then we stick it just <clears throat> into an ultra high vacuum chamber, and we basically put this cavity right into a MOT, into a cloud of laser cooled atoms. We have, you know, I don't know, 100,000 million or so atoms in there at about a millikelvin temperature. So now, we've, in terms of order of magnitude, we've gone pretty far. We've gotten this cavity very close to laser-cooled atoms. But actually, the density of atoms in the mod is such that there's essentially zero probability at any time that one of them is within the mode volume of this cavity because it's so small. So to rectify that, we then do some more things. We turn on an optical tweezer. This is just a tightly focused, ready-tuned laser beam. So atoms are uh, attracted to this, this region of high intensity in the middle. And then in this optical tweezer, we can, we can basically we can count with fluorescence the number of atoms that we have in there, and we just get one from the mod. And then we, once we have that one, we, we tr extinguish the mod and get rid of the rest of the atoms. And then we do some additional laser cooling to take this atom from sort of 100 microkelvin temperatures to really be nearly in the quantum ground state of motion in this potential with kind of kinetic temperatures, uh, you know, less than 10 microkelvin. Um, and then now, and then that takes the, reduces the thermal kind of position uncertainty of this from a, a few microns to a few hundred nanometers. And that's then small enough that now if we use a, a mirror on a translation stage to just physically drag the atom over to this cavity, we can, we can put it where we want. And kind of a, um, when, we, when we take this optical tweezer and we point it at this structure, it actually deforms from being just a Gaussian beam to a standing wave where the standing wave is formed by the interference of this optical tweezer and its own reflection of the structure. Um, and that part of it is so important that I want to spend another slide on it and, uh, and explain it more by, by way of showing you a numerical simulation of what this optical potential actually looks like as we do this translation of the optical tweezer. So, this is, uh, this is the intensity profile of a Gaussian laser beam. The brighter colors are higher intensity, and this beam is you know, focused by this lens indicated here schematically, and it's propagating to the right. Um, so the atom is going to be sort of, is going to live here in the bottom. And then this gray circle up here is a cross section of this photonic crystal kind of coming out of the plane. And when I move one of them relative to the other in the simulation, you can see how the potential evolves. And basically, the, um, there are, there are three things about this, this, this transport and the final potential that are, that are, I think, crucial to making this experiment work. The first is that this, this, uh, the, the atom will ultimately live in this intensity maximum here. And because you have a standing wave in this direction, you actually have extremely steep optical confinement 
if the atom in this, this, this steep confinement exists in exactly the direction along which the surface force is at. So you have the tightest possible trap basically in the direction where you need it. The second advantage is that this trap is very close to the surface of this structure. It's generically about lambda over four away, but we can actually tune that distance by changing the, changing the geometry of the structure, and you can in principle make it go all the way to zero or out to lambda over two. Additionally, because the, the distance here is the, um, the distance here is determined by this kind of round trip interference condition. If there's a little bit of uh, pointing uncertainty in the experiment, you know, this photonic crystal moves around a little bit relative to our optical tweezer, uh, these, these things will actually move together because basically the phase of the reflection moves together. So, so these things, there's a lot of common mode suppression in this geometry to, to, tech, to position fluctuations in the system. And then the third advantage is that um, this, if you watch how this potential evolves, you can also see that it's adiabatic in the sense that an atom starting in the optical tweezer, if it's cold enough, will actually just smoothly follow you know, what I've shown here in this white line. And so we can you know, essentially deterministically take an atom in the tweezer and then compress it into this little trap here. So these three things together are, are, are I think, really crucial to making this experiment work. So once we put these things together, we'd like to see that, you know, that actually, indeed, we do get the atom close to the structure and that it actually couples to it optically. And the simplest and most unambiguous way to, to show that is just to look at the, the Purcell enhancement of the decay of the excited state. So if this atom in free space, it decays at some rate. If you put it near the cavity, you present an additional rate. And then if you just measure the excited state lifetime in the time domain, you see both of these rates. And because you know what gamma zero is, you can infer something about gamma cavity. And so we do this uh, straightforwardly just by positioning our atom close to the cavity and then using a short pulse of light from the side to excite it uh, and then collecting fluorescence photons through the, through the waveguide. Um, and if you do this a bunch of times and look at when these fluorescence photons arrive, you see that the decay rate of, this, um, of the excited state near the cavity is 3 nanoseconds. The, you know, the literature value for rubidium in free space is 26 nanoseconds. So this you know, is an enhancement of almost a factor of 10. To make sure that in, in our actual experiment, this enhancement really results from resonant atom cavity coupling, we can detune the atomic resonance, or rather detune the cavity resonance from the atomic transition, and we see that this enhancement actually relaxes back on sort of a scale comparable to the cavity line with relaxes back asymptotically uh, eventually to one. And from this, we conclude that the cooperativity characterizing this atom photon coupling strength is, is about eight. And then based on our numerical model of what the electromagnetic field of the cavity mode looks like, we can infer that the distance between the atom and the surface is, is uh, less than 200 nanometers. For the cavity QED experts, these kind of G kappa gamma parameters are shown here, and in particular this G is, is, is um, probably the largest value reported for, for uh, laser-cooled atoms or ions, and that's just a direct consequence of this really small cavity that we're coupling to. Um, all right, so, so that's, the, that's the kind of the technique that we have. And now I want to switch gears a little bit. And you know, I just showed you how the presence of this cavity mode modifies the emission properties of the atom. But now we want to think about the reverse process, where we instead think about how the presence of the atom near this optical mode modifies the propagation of light through this structure. Um, and so, so if we have our, our one-dimensional cavity here, and we send in light that's resonant with the cavity, but there's no atom around, that light should just be transmitted just like in a fabric pro cavity. But now if we put in this atom that's strongly coupled to the cavity, you know, in the sense that the cooperativity is bigger than one, then this atom will basically block the light from entering the cavity, and rather than being transmitted, it will be reflected. Um, so this is what we'd like to probe. In reality, in our experiment, we have this you know, very efficient fiber taper on this side and really nothing going on over here, so it's actually inconvenient for us to access transmission. So what we do instead is we make a single-sided cavity by making the mirror segment on this end you know, a little bit longer or a lot longer than the one on this end. So now all the light comes back no matter what we do, but the same information about the presence or absence of the atom is now encoded in the phase shift of the light. So if there's no atom, light comes in and rattles around for a while and leaves with a pi phase shift. But with this atom there, the cavity is blocked and the light leaves promptly with this zero degree phase shift. But this kind of the analogy between transmission and reflection and this phase shift is you know, formally rigorous and exact, so you can kind of intuitively think about either picture. So in the experiment, we build an interferometer, um, and it's kind of nice with this all, everything fiber coupled. Actually, everything here is a fiber component, so it's, you know, we only had to align it once. Um, you build this interferometer, and it converts phase shifts essentially into polarization rotation, and we have these two ports out here that are formally equivalent to reflection and transmission for a symmetric cavity, and so this is kind of where we measure. And then if we look at how light propagates through the system without an atom, we see that the light is completely transmitted through the structure, but then in the presence of the single atom, the light is uh, reflected 75% of the time. So it's a huge modification just from this single atom. You can go a little further and actually probe directly the phase of the light reflected from the cavity, and as you scan through the atomic resonance, you see this goes from pi to zero and back to pi um, uh, with kind of a characteristic line width given by this Purcell-enhanced um, 
Purcell enhanced decay rate of, of sort of eight times the free space alignment. Okay, but this um, but this this modification, you know, the changing from transmission to reflection, you would also get if you put dirt on the cavity. So the the thing that's actually important about this being a quantum object, uh, you know, the is uh, what we'd like to explore now. And the kind of the simplest way to see that is to go look at rather than linear optical response, look at the nonlinear response. And the kind of the physics of this nonlinear response is that if I have only a single atom causing this light to be reflected instead of transmission, the single atom can only reflect one photon at a time. So what I said before about the atom blocking the cavity is true if I send in a pulse of light that has only one photon in it. But if I now send in a more intense light pulse that has some probability of having two photons at the same time, then they can saturate the atom. And there's actually some probability now that one or both of these photons will be transmitted or maybe scattered out to the side and lost. Um, so the simplest way to see this, the first way to see this in the experiment is actually just to look at the you know, the, the reflection and the transmission coefficient of the system as we crank up the power of light that we're sending at the rate of photons. And you see that there's a large linear regime over which this is essentially flat, but then when you get to some kind of critical photon flux, the reflection starts to drop and the transmission starts to go up. And the characteristic flux at which this, this, this nonlinear effect sets in is about one photon per atomic lifetime. So this is, you know, intuitively makes sense. Um, but all you can see from this graph is that really the, is that the, you know, reflection probability for multiple photons is lower than what it is for one photon. But actually, we think that with this quantum system, we can really make a much stronger statement than that. And that's actually that the reflection coefficient for two photons should be zero. Um, and so to see that, we, we measure the intensity autocorrelation function, really the, the, you know, the quantum statistics of the light that comes out of the system. And indeed, we see that in the reflection port, this, uh, this, uh, the G2 is actually zero um, when uh, uh, is actually zero, which means that there's no probability for two photons to reflect from the system. So this is kind of the strongest possible nonlinearity you could have in that sense. At the same time, as we also saw in some talks yesterday, if you look at the, uh, the transmitted part of the system, you actually see instead of anti-bunching, bunching. And this is a, means that there's you know, some enhanced probability for two photons to actually make it through the system relative to chance. And so if you put these two things together, you can kind of see this as a, a way of taking a coherent state input, which is, has mixed photon numbers, and sort of sorting it into single photons in this reflection port and pairs in the transmission port. Um, okay, um, so then we now kind of switch gears and think about another way that we can use the quantum properties of this atom to kind of control the propagation of light as a quantum level, which is to we'll kind of introduce two quantum states of the ground of the atom that will be hyperfine states in the ground state, where one of these will be sort of on in the sense that it will uh, block the light from being transmitted, and the other will be off in the sense that the, the, you know, the light won't see the atom in that state, and then it can go through. Um, and now because we can create quantum superpositions of these states and things like that, that will let us play, uh, you know, have quantum, quantum control over this light propagation. So we'll kind of uh, come up with these, these on and off states. And then what we'll do specifically is use uh, a single photon to actually toggle the atom from the on to the off state. And in that way, we'll get kind of a nonlinear action between two optical fields where one quantum field turns this thing on or off, and then it controls the propagation of a subsequent classical signal field or quantum. Um, so the, the way that we'll implement these on and off states is, is sort of the simplest way possible without a lambda system or anything complicated like that. Just use two ground states of this rubidium atom that are quite different in frequency. And then we'll choose the frequency of the light that we send in, that we probe the system with, and therefore also the cavity, so that it's resonant with, with the transition from this state C, which we'll call the coupled state, to some excited state. But the same frequency light is not resonant with any transition starting from the U state. So if the atom is in C, the light comes in and sees... Uh, this resonant atom and it's blocked, but if the atom is in U, the light comes in and it just doesn't see anything that's off, very far off resonant and it goes through. Uh, we implement this in rubidium using these two hyperfine ground states uh, in F equals one and F equals two, and we have a whole array of atomic physics techniques to optically pump and prepare in these and then use microwaves to make uh, coherent manipulations between them. And the first thing to see is that these states actually do have the on and off properties that I advertised. And, and we can just extend our previous measurement where if we see full transmission without an atom, uh, uh, pretty high reflection with one atom if it's in this coupled state now in F equals two, but then if we put the same atom into the uncoupled state into F equals one, we again see full transmission. So because the splitting is so much larger than every other energy scale, um, this state is quite uncoupled. So it's, this actually shows you kind of the fraction of photons that go one way or the other. But something else that's important is that in a single run of the experiment, can we send in enough photons to actually say with confidence what the state of the atom was in a single shot before we say, to destroy it by pumping it to another state. And this, this histogram shows under kind of typical experimental conditions, the number of photons that we detect in this reflection port um, as a function of what state we uh, prepare the atom in initially. And you see we can get this fairly well resolved histograms where with 
sort of at least 95% fidelity, we can say in a single shot what state the atom is in. Okay, so um, now uh, what we'd like to do is use, basically use, uh, you know, light coming into the cavity and specifically a single photon to manipulate the atom within this, uh, this, this, uh, this Hilbert space of this coupled and uncoupled state. And so we do this using a scheme uh, proposed by, by Luming Drawn and Jeff Kimball uh, 10 years ago, um, which, is, uh, which sort of works as follows. So if I prepare the atom in a superposition of this coupled and uncoupled state, and then I reflect a single photon off the cavity, remember here that this is, in, in reality, this cavity is single-sided, so that photon always comes back, but it comes back with a phase shift that depends on which state the atom is in. And now if I essentially don't measure the phase of that photon after it comes back, then this, the phases of these reflection coefficients actually get written onto the wave function of the atom. So specifically, if my initial state is that I prepare this C plus U superposition of the atomic states and send in one photon, after that photon reflects, this minus sign ends up down here, and I have my, my, you know, my outgoing photon leaves the atom in this, this orthogonal quantum state, C minus U. And then in the experiment, we can turn this into a rotating the atom from C to U just by sandwiching it between some uh, microwave pulses. So the full experimental sequence that we do is to prepare the atom in the uncoupled state and then use a microwave pulse to prepare C plus U send in this gate photon, and then use another microwave pulse to map back to, to the vertical axis of the block sphere and then probe the atomic state at the end. Uh, and if we look with this probe field at the probability that we find the atom at the end of this sequence in the coupled state, we see that if we don't send in any light during this kind of gate period here, we have a very low probability to find the atom in the coupled state. But if we do, uh, then we have a relatively high probability to find the atom in the coupled state. So we, we sort of think of this as switching the state of the atom with just this single photon. So there are a couple of, of caveats to this. The first is that we don't actually have a single photon source in the lab. So when I say here we use one gate photon, what I mean is we use a weak coherent state and we post-select on, on cases where we detect this in reflection. Um, the other thing is that, you know, this, so we call this variously a switch or a transistor, and that's a, you know, a, the, the reason is that if you think about it as kind of an optical device, basically this, this, you know, small field here controls the propagation of a much larger field. But really, if you, if you, know, you actually think about what is going on here, what we really should have is a quantum gate between this photon and the, and the spin of this atom. And it should really be a coherent operation between them. And so to actually uh, probe this coherence a little bit, we can do an additional experiment where we basically do some kind of tomography to really try to measure you know, what is the phase of this wave function uh, before and after we send in this gate photon. And so we, we do this just by changing the phase of this second microwave uh, pi over two pulse. And now we're basically doing a Ramsey type experiment. So without sending in this gate photon, we see this, this sort of Ramsey fringe and the population probability to find the atom in the coupled state after the second pulse. Um, but, and if we do the same thing, but now we're post-selecting the single photon, we again get a, a coherent oscillation, but now the phase of this is shifted by pi. So this pi phase shift is just sort of a direct measurement of the fact that this single photon sh changes the phase of this superposition by pi, which is the coherent operation that we wanted. Um, but now, if you, uh, if you look really closely at this graph, you see not only is this thing phase shifted by pi, but also the amplitude of the oscillation of this blue curve is a little bit lower than the red curve. Um, and, uh, and what that, you know, that's a, sort of a consequence of a couple of technical effects that all add up to a little bit, but the, the dominant effect is actually just that in this particular experiment, we, we used maybe a, a few too many gate photons. So if the mean number of gate photons that we used was 0.6, that means that actually when you, when you post-select on detecting this reflected photon, there's a fairly significant probability that you had not one, but instead two photons. And if one photon rotates you once around the block sphere, two photons will take you twice. Um, and, that, uh, and that kind of destroys a little bit the coherence of this. Um, OK, so, um, so actually, so now I um, sort of put together a couple, of, uh, a couple of new slides that I wanted to kind of ask the question, you know, at the very beginning of my talk, I, I said that the advantage of using these atoms that there's, compared to maybe some solid state system, is that there's no inhomogeneous broadening, that these, you know, should be perfect systems and every atom is basically the same. The reason that you want this is that you would like in the long run to imagine that you can make something where you have a whole bunch of atoms in different places and then, you know, at any point in time, you can just have kind of resonant interactions between them and you don't have to worry about the fact that they might have different local environments or something like that. But really in this experiment, I mean, there are a few things that, well, maybe they're not exactly in homogeneous broadening. They sort of have the same effect on your system as in homogeneous broadening. And so I want to actually talk a little bit, kind of go under the hood of, of what I talked about before and, and maybe give some numbers on, on these effects and also talk about how we have, have dealt with them in this experiment and might improve them in the future. And so the three problems that we'll talk about, the first is that, you know, this atom isn't always there. In fact, it's there, uh, you know, in, in human terms, a very small fraction of the time. Um, and also, when the atom is in this trap, it actually moves. 
around a little bit because it has some formal excitation and that that couples in in two ways. The first is that it, it changes the cooperativity basically as it moves around in this cavity mode, the atom cavity coupling strength changes, but also because it's moving around in this dipole trap which produces a large AC star shift on the atomic transition, it also means that the atomic resonance frequency moves in time as this atom moves around. Um, so I just want to say a few things about these. So basically the, the experimental sequence that we run uh, looks like this. We run this over and over again. And we spend uh, some time from 0.2 to 2 seconds getting an atom into this optical tweezer and preparing it, this Raman cooling. And then quite quickly, actually, we move it to the cavity. We maybe could even make this faster, but sort of typically we do this in 10, 10 or so milliseconds. And then we keep this atom near the cavity. It's, its lifetime in this trap near the, near the cavity is about 100 to 200 milliseconds if we don't do anything. We just leave it there. Um, and this is during the time during which we can do our quantum optics experiment. So this is, you know, this is actually not so bad in the grand scheme of things. If you really tweak this up, you could imagine that we could actually have an atom near, you know, in this trap near the cavity maybe more than 50% of the time, which is a pretty high duty cycle. Um, but then the next problem is that, you know, in this experiment, actually, we usually don't get this 100 or 200 millisecond lifetime because the atom is really heated pretty rapidly by the photons that we send in to do this quantum optics experiment. And, and in reality, the practical limit is that we can send in about 1,000 photons after bringing the atom in before it's lost due to heating. Um, so in the long run, you'd like to improve this by doing in-situ laser cooling. And actually, Gerhard Rampa's group has some very kind of inspirational results from the last uh, 10 years or so of solving all the technical problems in their fabric pro system where they're now able to keep at a, I think, you know, personally, they told me maybe they have 30 seconds now in the system where they just keep probing, but then recooling and probing and recooling the atoms in the setup. So ultimately, there's no reason you can't do something like this near the surface. But for now, we're kind of limited to this. And so what that means in practice, in a single run of the experiment, if we, or in the experiment, if we bring the atom to the cavity and then we look, you know, we probe it with a whole bunch of pulses over maybe 100 milliseconds here, uh, we see that if you average over many runs of the experiment, the reflection from the cavity just decays in time because you lose the atom. So this, this is not so good because at this time, you know, in principle, you have only a 30% chance of having the atom and it's hard to do the experiment like that. But if we actually look at data from just a single shot of the experiment, you see that we get enough photons from one atom that we can actually unambiguously say in a single run, you know, exactly when we lose the atom. And by using some kind of Bayesian analysis of these photon counts, we can actually say, you know, we can basically apply kind of a probability threshold of 1 minus 10 to the 10 or so on the, you know, the probability that we have an atom. And, and with this kind of post-selection, we basically know with, with complete certainty that in all the data runs where we say we have an atom, we really have an atom. So although this doesn't help you in the long run in your giant network sense locally, we, you know, this is how we've solved this inhomogeneous problem in our experiment. We know for sure when we have an atom. Okay, so the second problem is motion of the atom. And here I've shown uh, a very low resolution uh, picture of the kind of the intensity profile of this, of this cavity. And, and basically there are two directions of motion that, that matter. One is that the atom can move this way along the cavity axis. And in this direction, it actually moves through the standing wave in the cavity. So it really can in theory go through points where the intensity is actually zero. Um, and then it can also move outwards from the cavity. And here you have basically a, a you know, exponential, which is locally linear steep slope in the coupling as a function of distance. Um, an additional complication is that depending on how you set this up, the cavity polarization might change with position. But, um, but anyway, so for now, we'll just focus on the, the value of the cooperativity. And so we can probe um, this atomic motion in the experiment actually by just looking at uh, uh, the intensity autocorrelation of the reflected light from the system. And if we, uh, we look at this, uh, you know, as a, as a function of time, you see that in, um, you get these kind of wiggles in the G2, so it's not completely flat. And then if you take the Fourier transform of these wiggles, you see that there are actually just a few discrete frequencies that appear. Um, and, and in particular, the, the way we've kind of identified these frequencies is that um, these three peaks here are three harmonics of the motion in this direction. Um, and the reason you get harmonics of the fundamental trap frequency is that actually, this is not, you know, the, the Cooperativity doesn't vary linearly with position, but it varies sinusoidally. And if you move through a non-negligible fraction of that standing wave period, you get these harmonics. And then there's also another peak here at this high frequency, which is the, the motion in this direction. Um, so you can see that tightest trap frequency is actually almost a megahertz. So, um, so this is a problem as well. Um, but actually, I've shown here two data sets, and one of these G2s is taken on resonance, or off resonance, and the other one is taken on resonance. Um, and you see actually that the, the oscillations and also the the Fourier transform signal is much smaller in the resonant data than the on-resonant data. And the reason for that is that this reflection actually kind of saturates with cooperativity. So if, the ref you know, the, if you change your cooperativity by a factor of two, let's say you go from 10 to five, you actually don't get that much change in the reflection coefficient of the system compared to changing it from one to a half, where you get a huge reflection. So by going off resonance and making the overall cooperativity smaller, you, you enhance the effects of these fluctuations. 
But the fact that these kinds of you know, schemes like this Duan Kimball gate that we showed are not very sensitive to the atomic motion when you do them on resonance was I think actually, is, this is actually mentioned directly in the, the original Duan Kimball paper as the main feature of this gate that it's locally, that it's kind of insensitive to small changes in the atom cavity coupling. So there, that's, you know, I would say, the kind of the scheme that we have for dealing with this. All right, the third point um, is that um, this motion also gives you um, an inhomogeneous AC Stark shift. Basically, the dipole trap actually shifts the atomic transition frequency by, by more than 100 megahertz. So if the atom moves around a little bit, this, this, trap fre this uh, atomic frequency can easily change by, uh, by a line width. And also, if you imagine that you had sort of several of these traps or an array of these traps, it's not necessarily guaranteed that these Stark shifts would be the same in all the traps. Um, so, so you know, this is something that you have to deal with. So one nice long-term solution to this problem would be to use optical traps that are where the wavelength of the trapping light is at what's called a magic wavelength, where the polarizability is actually the same for these two states, so then you can just ignore this effect. This is actually not really possible for rubidium, and in, in general, it's not, not easy for every atom. Um, but uh, the way that we solve this problem is actually to just modulate very rapidly the dipole trap intensity and time with a kind of a pure sinusoid. Um, and, and then we only probe the atom during the periods where the dipole trap is actually off. And there's sort of a hierarchy of scales that's required for this to work, which is that you have to modulate uh, at least faster than twice the trapping frequency, so the atom isn't heated by the modulation. But then if you want to uh, only probe when the light is off, and you want to probe resonant with the atom, you need to be able to make your probing pulses long enough that they're not sort of Fourier broadened past the atomic line width. So you basically also need this modulation frequency to be quite slow compared to your Purcell enhanced atomic line width. But we have this hierarchy of scales in the system, so it's okay, and if we modulate it about 5 megahertz, then we can do sort of 20 nanosecond, 25 nanosecond pulses that are within this line width, but just don't see the dipole trap at all. And uh, so, you know, we first developed this as kind of a hack that we thought maybe, okay, we can't do a magic wavelength, but this will work. But actually this technique, um, I mean, it works one very well. So you really, you actually don't see any decrease in the lifetime at all from this fast modulation, but also it gives you an additional knob. So in, you know, in, in circuit QED or, or with these quantum dots, it's, you know, like to tune the atoms in and out of resonance with the cavity. And in some sense, you can think of this as basically being able to tune the atoms in and out of resonance, you know, quite fast on this modulation time scale. And the way that we're deploying this in kind of the current generation of experiments is actually with, you have two optical tweezers with two atoms. Sometimes you would like both of them to be coupled to the cavity, sometimes just one, sometimes the other. And if you're modulating both traps, but then you rapidly shift the phase of the modulation of one with respect to the other, you can actually make it so that a photon that you send in at a certain time only talks to one atom or the other. And so this actually might be, might be kind of a powerful tool for controlling systems with many atoms. So, okay, so, you know, the, the goal was to control this photon propagation, and given the cooperativity that we demonstrated, uh, we've, you know, been sort of initially successful in that we think that about 90% of the light emitted by this atom should go into our target mode. Um, in the long run, you'd really like to make much larger arrays of these things, and this is kind of what, what these guys are working on now in the lab. Um, you know, if, at the level that you want sort of one to tens, maybe, of these, these traps, you can imagine using holographic techniques to make arrays of optical tweezers and, and manipulating them, and that's, that's exciting. In the, the very long run, though, it's, it's also, I think, quite exciting to think about what you might be able to do if you could do all the trapping and cooling using light that was actually guided on, on a chip like this itself, because now you could make, you know, potentially quite a large number of traps and then in quite a complicated optical circuit and then just kind of shower it with cold atoms somehow that would self-assemble into these things. You could make pretty complicated things. Um, so uh, with that, I will, uh, I, uh, will conclude, but I'd like to say again that this work was done at Harvard and Misha Lukin's group in collaboration with Laden, and there were a number of people, particularly these postdocs, uh, who were quite, you know, did all this work together with me. So thanks very much for your attention. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, that's what I'd like to say. Um, but actually, you know, whether you get this uh, two pi phase or not, it depends a little bit on what you mean by two photons. Because I showed you earlier that two photons actually go through the cavity and aren't reflected. But it, so if it's two photons, you know, at this like within this kind of excited state lifetime, then that's a nonlinear effect. But we keep the intensity low enough so that that's definitely not going to happen. So when we say two photons, then what we really mean is that it's likely that there's one photon at the beginning of the pulse, say, and then one at the end. So they came separately but integrated over the whole window, the first photon gave you a pi phase shift, the second one later gave you another pi. So it's two photons in that sense. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, your overall detection efficiency, I mean, the APDs, we start with only 60%. So I think that's not going to, the, 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 we basically never actually detect the two photons. So we basically, you know. Yeah, well, so, okay, so that, that you know, the, that, that measurement in particular we actually kind of did with the dipole trap still on. That was before we had come up with this modulation technique. So the interpretation of that is, I mean, quite complicated because you have all this inhomogeneous broadening and stuff that we sort of chose not to model. But let's say given later measurements, you know, where um, it's, things are, are close but not, not quite right. So this cooperativity of eight, you know, I mean, we, we ha know from this G2 data that the atom is moving around. And this, this, is, this cooperativity of eight is a relatively good parameter that captures a lot of the behavior, but we know that it's not just eight all the time and constant, and that it's, that it's fluctuating. So, you know, we think, I mean, yeah. And from, based on our model of the cavity mode and the potential, I think we were actually expecting something maybe two to three times higher. Um, but. Uh, so do you understand the heating rates, or we just uh, yeah, it's it's just it's just measured. I think it's a little more than naive, you know, one recoil on average per photon, um, which you would kind of expect in the system because there's really, um, you know, as as Jeff also mentioned, uh, when you have a a little bit of circular polarization in your dipole trap, you have a strong magnetic sublevel dependence to the trapping potential, um, and then every time we scatter a photon, because we're not really using a cycling transition because we have this linearly polarized cavity mode the atom will actually kind of diffuse around the different magnetic sublevels, and then you can get this kind of fluctuating dipole force heating. So it's, uh, well, we've, it's, we've not really tried to quantitatively know. So uh, to me, fluctuating dipole force heating could be anything. I mean, you, you know, <laughs> it could be anything. Um, so, uh, and in fact, in some early experiments we did, we actually had such a badly circularly polarized trap that um, some of the magnetic sublevels were not trapped. Um, so in that case, you know, fluctuating dipole force heating meant that you scattered two photons and then you were gone. So, um, but what we measure actually appears to be a lot less than is, uh, this, you know, uh, is, uh, I think we would get, like, if you do just now, you would increase the number of emitting rates, so you would, you would really, you would not be able to scatter a thousand points. Yeah, what, what, what would you like to do? Yeah, yeah. So, there is a lot of time in the other one. I think it's a blockade mechanism that the fact that there are some. You mean the fact that it transform as you move this thing across, or? I mean, you have all the holes, or is it just? So the holes actually don't, I mean, the holes don't matter a whole lot in terms of the trapping potential. I would say the, the first answer is that, you know, what you design this structure, and we design the structure to do two things. One is to, most important is to give us a cavity resonance at the rubidium. But the second thing is to kind of make sure that this reflected potential from the side. Yeah. And naively, this is a, a, like a really complicated, because both of these things are computationally complex to figure out, and it's a constrained optimization problem. In reality, it turns out that actually the holes don't affect, that you have decoupled parameters. So basically, the thickness of the cavity and the direction along which the tweezer propagates more or less completely determines the tweezer behavior, regardless of how wide the structure is or how big the holes are, until they get close to a wavelength in size. Um, so then you can kind of pick that and then then design your cavity and you sort of don't have to go, to go back. The second uh, trapping on the other side of the beam is just created by the holes? Or is, or is it you, the you get it without the holes. I think you can just think of it as focusing, yeah. focusing of the beam. The holes are really quite small. So unless you're within, you know, uh, I mean, the holes are maybe 100 nanometers, 150 nanometers. So unless you're within that distance, you just don't see them because of diffraction. They have only an effective contribution from changing the effective index. 